With us on Primetime Business News now in less than a week, Finance Minister Pravin Gordon will present his budget. And the question we're asking tonight is what would a transformative budget look like? There is a concern that more than 20 years since the dawn of democracy, there's been no substantial change in ownership and income patterns in South Africa. The majority of large businesses are still owned and run by white people. In his reply to the State of the Nation Address debate in Parliament today, President Jacob Zuma said the fact that white households earn five times more than black households cannot sustain a prosperous future for all. Well, let's uh, join uh, now Professor Ivan Churok. He's with us in Cape Town. He's executive director at the Human Sciences Research Council. Uh, thank you for being with us, uh, Professor. Firstly, do you agree that this economy is uh, quite grossly skewed still? It is, and it's the most unequal country, the most unequal economy in the world. But uh, beyond what President Zuma said, it's not, so, not just a matter of income inequality. The, the gap in wealth is, is greater still. Something like 10% of uh, households uh, in South Africa own 95% of the wealth. That's the, uh, the property, the assets, the stocks and shares that make up uh, the wealth of the country. And so that's very skewed, and as I say, it's the biggest in the world. He, he's been uh, accused of being a bit disingenuous in the State of the Nation address, the President saying uh, that, uh, bringing up this 10% direct ownership on the JSC. Uh, but if he had gone further, that's in fact uh, bigger than white direct ownership on, on the JSC. Uh, does it depend what you emphasize or, or is it all bad news? No, it does depend. And, and unfortunately, there's not a, a lot of uh, very reliable research in this area. So. Uh, it depends on whether you look at uh, property or at stocks and shares or at other forms of wealth like um, art collections or antiques. There's all sorts of different uh, aspects of wealth that are really important to look at. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a comprehensive picture of it because it's, it's, uh, it's a sensitive subject and uh, under-researched, actually. So it's really important that we do more systematic analysis so that we have more agreement on what the basic picture is before we really talk start talking about uh, dramatic changes in policy. The, the question is, if government wants to act, uh, you're saying we need more research. If it, if it wanted to, how much scope is there uh, to encourage transformation in a budget? I think there is a, a fair amount of scope. It's, it's obviously a tricky area. This is people's uh, income, their, their capital, the wealth that they've earned over, over their lifetime. But I think the fact that South Africa is the most unequal uh, country in the world suggests that there is scope to change things. Uh, and I think there's the social pressures and the political uh, backlash and dis dis instability surrounding uh, our inequality suggest that there is a need to do something. Mm. Um, it seems to me we do need further research, but there are some things we already know which gives us some scope to do things. So for example, there are two approaches to doing something about the wealth inequality. The first one is to redistribute from the top, and the easiest way of doing that is to close loopholes around the transfer of wealth from one generation to the next, because that's where the visibility of wealth becomes most apparent. You can't hide your wealth if you want to pass it on to your children. So there are loopholes that people use, setting up trust funds, for example, that uh, the, the Minister of Finance is looking at and is one way of, of, of addressing that issue. And the other way is to build wealth from the bottom right, by helping households to save in their pensions and helping them to own housing. So those are two other ways of where, which is less sensitive if you're actually helping people at the bottom because you're not taking money away from, from other groups. Yeah. So um, there are two approaches. We tend to focus on the first one and I think it don't give enough emphasis to the second one. Both are important. Okay, let's focus on the first one first, uh, because so so we do have estate uh, duties and capital gains tax. Some say that's a wealth tax, and and it's interesting what you're saying. Close the loopholes as well. Beyond that. Um, do you think we already have a form of wealth tax because we have this uh, progressive system and if we closed the loopholes we'd catch those people or is there scope for uh, a bigger tax on high earners possibly even white high earners well at the moment most of the tax comes through uh, the income uh, tax system uh, and and in fact it's about 20 times as much as we get through the wealth the estate duties and wealth uh, tax system so uh, there must be, I think, more emphasis on that, on the, on the transfer, the estate duties. 
And that's where uh, closing the loopholes is so important because people em employ accountants, they employ tax advisors, and they find ways of doing this. And so uh, that's the low hanging fruit, so to speak, the area where the biggest difference can be made in the short term, I think. And then if you go to the bottom rung that you were talking about, how would the budget change if you really wanted to focus on that? I think the budget needs to give more incentive for people to, to save in their pensions. The government started doing that, but I think it could do it much more. So instead of people consuming and spending everything they earn, they should be putting a small part of it away regularly and building up, particularly in pension schemes, because this is when they re really need the income most, when they, they are no longer working, or indeed between, if they have gaps, spells of unemployment, they need to have some sort of asset to fall back on, and that's where as I say, savings, particularly in the form of pensions, is most important and where we have the biggest gap in South Africa. The, the middle class, so to speak, uh, compared with many other countries, really lack um, wealth compared uh, with uh, better off groups in society. And so that seems to me critically important. We also need to get the housing market working much better so that people, we're building more housing, increasing the stock of homes, increasing the value of people's property. Again, this gives them uh, a real asset, a cushion to fall back on when times are hard. Yeah. Well, well, this brings me to a question that a lot of people ask. Is uh, white monopoly capital uh, trying to stop change or does government in fact have a whole lot of policy tools in front of it? One is land redistribution, uh, maybe giving people titles and, and it's been slow. Who do we blame here? There's a huge amount of rhetoric in this area because of the sensitivities, because of the instability in, in the country at the moment. Um, government tends to, politicians tend to respond with, you know, slogans and, 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 and lots of broad statements that perhaps appeal politically, but may not be very practical. As I say, oh, there are some very concrete measures that we really need to sit down and carefully examine and work out practical arrangements that are not going to worsen the situation and inflame opinion, but are actually going to help people in reality. Mm. And land is part of it, but we actually, most people in South Africa live in cities. So we must look at making land available for housing that I was talking about to give people a real asset instead of living in shacks, instead of living in uh, rented property. People must have that, that asset. And there's a lot government can do to make land better available and accessible to employment, which would also help incomes and help living standards improve. So uh, I think uh, moving away from slogans seems to me really important so that we uh, deal in a very practical and hard-headed way with the uh, realities of trying to change and improve the situation. And, and Professor, this is something you've looked at, um, housing, uh, spatial development in cities. Does the government own a lot of this, this land uh, that could be given or do you support uh, calls for expropriation, maybe where we have to? I think in the first instance, we must use publicly owned land much more effectively. So we have national departments, public affairs, public works, we have uh, Ministry of Defense, and we have many state entities like Transnet that own lots of surplus land which is no longer required for their operations. Government needs to get its act together and make this land available in the first instance. This again is the relatively easy kinds of things to deal with, which are uncontroversial you're not taking somebody's property away from them, and it's unused and wasted at the moment. So it's a tremendous resource that we should be making available uh, much more quickly than we are to speed up processes and pr make this land available for, uh, for public bodies and private developers to build uh, new neighborhoods and new settlements in well-located parts of our cities. And we've heard that call frequently. Professor, finally, and, and very quickly, can we have a transformative budget without blowing the budget? Uh, Pravin Gordon has tried to keep debt in, in check. We've got these rating agencies uh, hanging over our heads about debt. Should we spend our way out of this problem, or, or can we be clever and actually still be uh, conservative in how we spend? The, the, the budget is perhaps the most difficult uh, that we've faced since 1994. The economic environment is, is precarious. Uh, public debt has been rising rapidly. And so the hands of the Minister of Finance are closely tied. So I think he has to be very clever in devising ways of closing loopholes like I talked about on, in terms of estate duties, uh, where people really need to pay 
uh, more tax and ought to pay more tax, but also in incentivizing uh, savings in pensions and other schemes, housing, for example, uh, which is not going to cost a great deal. This, this is not big spending programs, but these are really measures that will make a difference and transform over time people's living circumstances in very, very important ways. Professor, thank you for your time. I hope we can chat again. Uh, Ivan Churik from the uh, Human Sciences Research Council.